that's very much related to an ongoing series we now have at the cathedral that looks at sanctuary from many, many different perspectives. When we think about sanctuary, we really come down to thinking about safety of each individual and what it means to have um, a culture and a society that respects the dignity of everyone, no matter where they are, whoever they are, wherever they live. And um, from our perspective, Planned Parenthood and International Planned Parenthood is a natural partner for the cathedral. So we're very excited to think about having this very serious conversation tonight, moderated by Alex Sanger and our very special guests, who I'm looking forward to hearing from. So please welcome, and um, we hope that this will be the first of many conversations. Thank you. Welcome, thank you so much for coming out, joining us. Thank you so much to the Cathedral St. John the Divine uh, for hosting this important conversation here tonight. My name is Giselle Carino. I'm the CEO of the International Planned Parenthood Federation Western Hemisphere Region, IPPFWHR. Um, <laughs> yes, thank you. Um, we are a network, and it's such a privilege to lead this organization, a network of uh, organizations that provide healthcare in almost every country in the Americas and the Caribbean. Last year alone, we serve about 7 million clients, most of them women, uh, the great majority of them poor and underserved. We also work, as you know, to uh, really change restrictive laws uh, related to reproductive autonomy and are one of the largest sex education providers in the region for young people. Um, we are here tonight in the context of the Cathedral uh, Sanctuary Exhibit and we'll be talking about the ways in which IPPF WHR and our local partners provide sanctuary for health and safety for women and girls in crisis situation. Um, you know, we provide care to women who can't afford to go to a clinic or those women who can't travel to one or those who are in transit and have been forced to migrate to many, many of them are survivors of uh, gender-based violence and forced pregnancies. And um, as you know, we live in a region where about 97% of us uh, live in countries where abortion is completely prohibited or highly uh, restrictive. Um, this situation, which is uh, pretty challenging, is exacerbated by the magnitude that we are seeing of migration and displacement. We are seeing the largest amount of people on the move ever. And um, we know that women and girls bear the brunt of the climate change and the political turmoil. Uh, we know that women and girls are the backbone of our society. And when disaster hit there, of course, uh, they feel the brunt of of this crisis and on, on several different dimensions. Uh, families and social structures become fractured, leaving women who are usually the caretaker of children uh, very much without support. Um, we, know, we know because the evidence tells us and our, uh, the stories of the women we serve are very much linked that the, the well-being of women is very much linked to the well-being of children. So when women can em be empowered to lead full and productive lives, children and families prosper. It's kind of obvious, right? And we have to keep repeating that. So during times of disaster where uh, gender inequality is, of course, exacerbated by living children, and especially girls in very vulnerable conditions, the latest evidence shows that uh, when girls are um, uh, in conflict setting, they're two and a half less likely to go to school than boys. So it is different. Sexual violence is prevalent, very prevalent. We know and we have known firsthand from the experience in Haiti after the uh, earthquake and other countries that have been impacted by natural disasters that uh, sexual and physical violence against women spike following disasters. And on top of that, we know also through the stories of the women we serve 
that many of them cannot continue their regular contraception uh, routines because of the collapse of the health systems. So um, as a federation of really locally owned organizations, uh, what we do is uh, we have a network of healthcare providers that provide care and work uh, to provide care to women and girls that are most in need under these circumstances. We are growing our capacity to respond and we are not going to back down in our fight to make sure that women and girls remain at the center of any humanitarian response efforts. Um, for a number of reasons. The most important one is that we believe health and healthcare, access to healthcare is a human right and human rights have no borders. I'm very thrilled to have with us such a, an impressive panel. So I'm going to be looking forward to really engaging in this conversation. And I'm going to introduce now Alex as the moderator. Alex Sanger is a lawyer by trade, a women's rights activist by heart. He is the chair of the International Planned Parenthood uh, Council and uh, also the grandson of one of the three very brave women that founded uh, International Planned Parenthood, Margaret Sanger. So, Alex, the floor is yours. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Giselle, and welcome, everyone. Good evening. It is um, an irony that we are situated tonight on, at this piece of land, uh, the uh, former location of the Leak and Watts Orphanage which was founded here in 1843 and was here till 1891. And this orphanage uh, took care of um, indigent and abandoned boys and girls throughout New York City uh, and were cared for at, at, a, uh, at then a bucolic uh, setting. And here we are, uh, the organizations that are represented here on the stage, um, dealing with orphans, the poorest orphans in the countries that uh, we represent. Um, the panelists today, let me, I'll do, do a brief um, introduction. Dr. Louise Towns Miranda, um, psychologist, psychoanalyst, serves on the board of the Planned Parenthood Action Fund. Marta Arroyo uh, is the executive director of our local member association in Colombia called Pro Familia. Belmar Franceschi, executive director of PLAFAM, our local member association in Venezuela. Olga Del Mar Reyes, a community social worker and student uh, who has worked with survivors in Puerto Rico of the hurricanes. And Myra Diaz Torres, clinical director from our local partner, Pro Familias in Puerto Rico. Now, if you were listening carefully, I named three organizations that are the local partners of IPPF, none of which were named Planned Parenthood. Um, my grandmother set it up that way because she wanted every country to create their own organization uh, to do family planning and reproductive health and to call it whatever name resonated uh, in their country. So of the 162 organizations around the world that are members of the IPPF, there are five that have the name Planned Parenthood, including the one in this country. We're going to talk tonight about uh, mostly uh, Puerto Rico and Venezuela and the migration uh, problems and refugee problems there. Uh, I want to start with our clinic director in Puerto Rico, Myra. Um, tell us, give us a, a brief uh, summary about, quickly yourself, because you've been on the job only a year. And yes. to, what, what were you doing before that? Well, before, um, good night. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. Right. Um, I, I always have worked in the, in the social arena, um, in the community-based initiatives. Um, before Pro Familias, I was working in boys and girls clubs. Right. We have uh, uh, 14 clubs in Puerto Rico. Um, I was there for 16 years, and one day I said, that's enough. <laughs> and I moved to this amazing opportunity. Um, sometimes the opportunity of a lifetime that you don't know you need it, but it arrives and, and I'm so happy 
It has mm. been only a year, but it has been the most mm. rewarding and um, exciting um, year. Many hardships. Right. So you came to Pro Familias after the hurricanes. Yes, I did. So you leapt into the frying pan. Yes, I did. And you, you with your eyes open. Yes, I did. Okay. <laughs> Tell us about what you, the services um, that Pro Familias offers, so we can understand well, what Profamil we do in Puerto Rico. Pro Familia um, offer services in three areas. First, sexual education. Um, it's, it's important to to children and youngsters to to be properly educated in in sexual um, um, sexual health. It should be as normal as math and history. Um, it's very important for them to have all the information they need to live responsible um, lives. Um, also, we work with contraceptions, with access to uh, contraceptive options for the women. Um, as Giselle was, um, was saying earlier, um, the time a woman decides to have a, a son or a daughter, the amount of sons and daughters that she wants to have is pivotal in to their, um, to their development as, as women. Um, and finally, we also um, work in a, with, social, uh, with sexual justice. Um, we are very active in, um, in promoting the, the defense of those um, sexual and reproductive rights so that women can empower themselves and live prosperous lives. Right. And then came two hurricanes. Yes, not one, and two. Two. <laughs> and did everything you were doing stop? And yes. So I understand you had no power, no water, staff had no way to get there, patients had no way to get to you. So yes. tell us what, what it was like and uh, the challenges of reaching the, the women and families who needed you. Well, we as Puerto Ricans, uh, we live in the Caribbean and we're used to having this storms and these hurricanes, but with Maria was completely different. It was a cyclone, super powerful, and nearly destroyed the, uh, our, 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 our island. So, um, but it passed and the women needed access to their services. Um, we, we were three months without electrical power um, but the women didn't stop coming. So we needed to um, tend the needs as well as we could with the resources we had. Um, but foremost, we, 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 were, um, we were there. We were there. We didn't have electricity, but we were there every single day uh, to do what we were able to do with our conditions. Um, women were searching for for the contraceptions, um, for the methods. Some of them were not available. Some of them were. Um, some of them um, came with other uh, necessities. So we, we tried as, a, as an organization um, of reproductive um, justice, we, we tended to their, to their needs. Mm -hmm. we, yes, we have here um, the, the, the staff to um, give you the service, but we also know that you need other type of, of, of things. You need water, you need um, um, food, mm -hmm. you, need, um, you need counseling. So we were able to, to, to expand our reach in order to tend to, the, to their needs. Um, we were, as I told earlier, three months without power. Um, after three months, we have powered some days. Uh, and we're still struggling as a, right. as a country with that, um, with that uh, power issue. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, there were problems before Maria that w were exacerbated. Um, right now, we are 
much better. Um, we were able to, to bounce back. We were a very resilient organization. Um, and we were there for our patients, which, mm. which is very important to us. Even though we didn't have what we needed to give them all mm. they needed, but we were there and we were able to, to right. tend their and needs. Before uh, the hurricanes uh, and after, did you, was there a change in the methods of contraception that either you could get or that yeah. the women wanted? Did women change their behavior and the, how they were? Yes, they need yeah. to, because with the power outage, um, some methods weren't available. Right. Um, the injections, um, we gave them the support they needed. We gave them uh, alternatives. Um, some of them were able to, do, to, to adjust. Um, mm. Some of them needed more time to adjust. But um, it all, all the needs were, were met as well as we could. Right. Um, and st did you have trouble uh, keeping your staff? Did your staff have trouble getting transportation to get to you? Have many staff left the island and come to New York or Miami? Well, so, um, we, we were lucky. Um, on our clinics, we, the, the, the staff is very, is very into their work and mm -hmm. the organization, and they, they stayed. Um, the majority of our staff we, we could retain, but the suppliers, the other um, the medical practitioners, practitioners, some of them left, and, right. and it's very understandable. Right. <laughs> Have you seen a rise in sexually transmitted diseases after the hurricanes? Yes, yes. Um, a rise in the, in the sexual transmitted infections, HIV, um, and it's very worrisome because it's in the young people. You know, we have teens and young adults having um, uh, this kind of, of of infections and right. and it's very wor w w made us worry. Yeah, yeah. we're we're going to get into this later with uh, Dr. Uh, Miranda. But uh, you saw PTSD, post traumatic stress syndrome, in your patients. Yes. And yes. Uh, so maybe we'll have a colloquy about that. Yes. In, in, in a few minutes, but you you saw that definitely. Yes, and trauma. There's, yeah. there, we're still de dealing with the trauma. Um, yeah. And some people lost everything, everything. Yeah. Their houses, yeah. their jobs, their significant right. others, because yeah. families were displaced. Yeah. Um, some, kid, some kids left their friends, their families, right. their known land to venture in, right. other, in other place, and that after the trauma of the, of the hurricane, you add up another layer of stress to that, mm. to that family, to that woman, to, right. to women who are the, the, the head of the family, yeah. mostly. Yeah. And tell me what, uh, you know, I, I, I can safely predict there will be more hurricanes. And tell me what, what is Profamilius, what are you preparing? What, what are your contingency plans yes, for the, um, the next one. Yeah, Profamilias is, is very uh, conscious about this possibility. Right. We're in the, in the hurricane season right now, so every week <laughs> comes with the, with the possibility of something um, happening. But we learn a few things. We learn to be sustainable. We, need, we, we learn to to strengthen the, the ties with the community. We uh, learn to build and, and, and foresee and plan on, on our own sustainability. Because we knew with this crisis how important we are to the families right. that, we, that we serve. And, and they deserve to have the assurance that no matter what, we're going to be there, and that's a huge responsibility. And we are assuming right. it. Um, we are right. um, creatively um, ongoing in, in projects that are not 
um, traditional. We are um, making uh, collaborations with other organizations, community-based mm. organizations. That is a, 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 a learning and a, and a value that came right. of, of this crisis. We, right. we strengthen our ties with the community, with other organizations that could complement our services. Right. And um, in, after Maria, if we didn't have, uh, the, we tried as much as we could, but if we didn't have the, the means right. or the resources necessary, we could refer to other right. organizations. And Good. that woman, that woman got the, the, the service that she, that she wanted. Right. Well, that'll be a relief to Olga, who um, <laughs> is and was one of your patients. Um, Olga's also a community um, social worker and a student. Um, before we get, in, get to your patient experience, um, where were you during the hurricane? What happened to you? Is your house standing? How's your family and okay. your dog <laughs> and your cat? <laughs> Okay, so my dog is fine. <laughs> also, um, my parents are fine, um, but my home is not safe. At this point, um, I live in a 11th floor, and the the balcony door just went flying. And at the, that was in 2017. Um, the the insurance was supposed to pay for that, and we're, we're still waiting. We don't have money. It's thousands of dollars to pay to repair that. So right now, if another hurricane comes, we are completely vulnerable. There's no way that, you know, we, we can't have anything in the house. Um, uh, when the hurricane passed, I worked in the government, in the office, what would you call it? A senior citizen's C office? A senior yeah. citizen's office. Yeah. Um, so I, I had to work uh, during, the, during um, the aftermath of the hurricane with uh, elderly people, with people that were um, in camada, in bed. In bed. Bedridden. Yep. With people that were bedridden. Um, they didn't have food. They didn't mm. have water. They didn't have transportation. And we didn't either, basically. The people right. helping, we didn't have a lot of, you know, we were suffering too, but, you know, we were the ones that were mm. supposed to be there working, so we still we did. did it. And you, you had no power in your building. No. So I, you walked up and down 11 floors. Yeah, every single day I had to go up and down. If I forgot something right. <laughs> downstairs, it was a nightmare. And... It, it was it was really hard like sometimes we, you saw people like in the parking lot just like thinking about oh my god I have to to go upstairs and all of this it, it was dark because yeah. you know the, the, the there weren't lights yeah. it, it was dangerous there was a lot of sexual harassment right. like it, when I went to my home that is usually it, it was a safe place before because of all of this, it, there was a lot of uh, sexual harassment in the streets. I was uh, always with the pepper spray and the taser uh, in my hands because it, you know, it was not safe. Mm -hmm. um, during the hurricane, I had to go to my uh, grandma's right. sister's home. It was the safest uh, home in our family, but she is very conservative Catholic, as well as my grandmother. They don't like tattoos, I have 10. <laughs> they don't know it. <laughs> um, and uh, they obviously don't know that I use contraception. So at, at that point, I was using the ring. That, that's one of the methods that have to be refrigerated. So it was really hard because my method was flo floating around in the cooler with the bottled water. <laughs> and I was like always guarding the cooler to make sure that no one grabbed to see what was in there. It was very stressful. Right. So as, as soon as, I mean, I was, we were um, in the apartment. There, there wasn't a fan. There wasn't 
we couldn't open windows and I was with my long sleeves and my sweatpants. I'm sorry. And it was really hot and it was really hard. So even though my home was not safe, I left because it was just, you know, I felt so repressed being there. And they're loving people, but it would be like, I, I can't even imagine right. because it's, it's not something that's acceptable. And even though from the outside, Puerto Rico may seem like an open-minded place, it's not, it's really conservative. And uh, that, that after right. the, yeah, so after the, the hurricane, a few days later, I decided that I couldn't go on with the same method because it was really stressful. I didn't know if I was going to be able to refrigerate it and if I was gonna be in that situation again. So I decided to change methods. I called and called Pro Familias, but they didn't answer. So I had to go to the office. Normally, that's nothing. I live in San Juan, the office is in San Juan, so that's nothing. But in this context, there was no gas. The gas lines were 12 hours. And then you got to the gas station and it was over. You didn't have any gas. So every single drop had to count. So in this context, I finally decided to go to the office and when I got there, they were closed because there wasn't any power. And then they told me to come back and when I came back, there wasn't any power. And I know that that was the reality of every single service in the island because I worked in the government and I had to turn back people too that right. needed our help because we couldn't be in that building because the windows didn't open. So it's understandable. Um, so how, but, how long did it take you to get an appointment at Pro Familias? Well, finally about, well, I, I had to go about two or three months without any method. Right. And I finally, when they were finally able to, with all of this situation, they were finally able to, uh, to, um, I, I, the IUD. IUD, right? yes. The IUD. So in January, so I was, this was in September and in January was when I was actually able to get this and my decision was completely based on the hurricane because before I was super happy with my method, but then uh, my body rejected the IUD, so they had to remove it and uh, that solution wasn't a, a reality for me. Right. And, and you've had to change methods since, yeah, multiple since, times. Since, uh, since March, I've had to change methods three times to see which one my body accepts. Definitely right. the Nuva Ring, I never had any problem, but it's really stressful to think that it won't be available in the clinic or that I won't be able to store it in my home. Right. Uh, Myra, just return to you for a minute. Um, are you now able to get all the contraceptive methods yes, in, yes, in stock yes. and available for the young people? Yes. So if a young person, if I may call Olga young, uh, comes in, uh, she gets reduced and subsidized services. Did you have to pay Olga when you came in? At, um, at that moment, I was qualified in a program and I didn't have to pay anything. Right. And I didn't have to pay anything for the IUD either. Um, and so tell me, it's now two years after the hurricanes. Um, have a lot of your friends left the country and come here? And what, tell yes. me about your plans. Yes. Okay. So uh, a lot of my friends have left Puerto Rico. Um, some looked for programs, uh, mm -hmm. in university programs to come study here because the situation in the university is also really hard. And mm -hmm. after the hurricane wars. Um, and uh, my plan is to stay in Puerto Rico because I mm. really have, like, uh, I love my island and I believe that I have to stay and, you know, right. um, work, work for everyone and make, you know, try to make everything better. But I know that it's not easy. It hasn't been easy. Um, for women, it's really hard in this context. The rights of women 
are being are, are in danger because they lose autonomy when when they cannot have access to contraception when they can't mm -hmm. have access to safe abortions to to just um uh women that are in a in a gender based uh, uh violence you know situation relationship they need a lot of support and right. pro familias you know they give that support right. and in this context it's really important that that you know we have access to all of that right. good that's a perfect segue to dr miranda um who has been to puerto rico uh many times including on a visit with us uh last fall and um tell me about the psychological impact of living through what our first two guests uh, live through. As, as they've referenced my, from the visits that I've had in Puerto Rico and with experiences here, my impression is that the traumatic impact came in waves. So on September 6th, a million people were left without electricity when the hurricane category five Irma went by. Yeah. So already one third of the island was blacked out. And then on September 20th, Hurricane Maria devastated the island. Uh, many of the residents had already been without electricity for two weeks and would go on without it for another four to 12 months. The complexity of the traumatic event was and is layered and persists. It's not over. Uh, the initial trauma was surviving Maria. It ravaged the island for hours, causing acute fear and destruction and deadly flooding. In the immediate aftermath, material losses were massive. Thousands of homes were destroyed, and cars, as you mentioned, are vital in Puerto Rico, were drowned. Loss of communication with the island was wide, as well as with the outside world. Multiple insecurities, as you've mentioned, were quickly evident, food insecurity, water insecurity, gasoline scarcity, cash scarcity due to the banks being closed and no functioning ATMs because of the massive, massive blackout. The blackout would persist to close to a year in some places. Medical facilities, hospitals, acute care clinics, and any residential facility was rendered inoperable and struggled to secure diesel for their emergency generators and many failed. Many residents who relied on electrical equipment like oxygen died. Uh, the ability for staff to travel to the jobs was nearly impossible. Without communication, uncertainty prevailed for days, especially the deeper in the island that the, that the, uh, that the, that the residents resided. Medical supplies and services most critical for, the, for chronic medical conditions were unavailable. Pharmacies did not open. In small towns, some pharmacists were at hand, but resupplies would not arrive for weeks or months at times. Within days, without electricity, deaths began to mount in medical institutions such as hospitals, nursing homes, and rehabilitation centers. Uh, one of our aunts, I have several relatives here, um, my aunt, my cousin's grandmother, died in a nursing home because she required oxygen and they just couldn't sustain it. Uh, with the lack of electricity, vital for refrigeration of medication for chronic conditions such as diabetes, which is rampant in Puerto Rico, uh, more deaths ensued. Dialysis patients were also impacted. There was no capacity to do any dialysis. In this desperate and chaotic scenario, women experienced a spike in domestic violence, uh, sexual harassment, and the accumulation of stress set off a wide range of symptoms in response to the chronic stressful aftermath. And when we say chronic, we're talking months and months of stress. There was a quick need for adaptation of survival mode as most had to try and meet their needs during daylight hours. Once the sun set, they were plunged into darkness. Without the mm -hmm. comforts of electric fans or air conditioners and temperatures soared and there were rainstorms as well. Daily activities had previously been supported by electricity were now having to be executed in pre-electricity mode, from cooking 
to washing oneself, one's clothes, one's dishes, and securing food and keeping food ed edible. Uh, clusters of individuals could be found in pockets of locations where, where an internet signal could be picked up. Notifying the family of your status was difficult on the island as getting information was as well to the mainland. Social media conveyed information. Facebook, and most notably, David Begnaught's Twitter account provided a lot of information. <laughs> He's like an honorary Latino man. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. Residents with some means soon departed the island, having camped at the airport desperate for flights to the mainland. Ill residents sought to leave for fear of health deterioration, the ones that could make it out, and slowly over months did. Some parents began to realize that the excruciatingly slow response would have an impact on their children's school year and relocated. The uncertainty of whether the move was temporary or permanent contributed to the anguish of entire families. Those that relocated faced adaptation uncertainty, as well as the loss of their community, employment, and family on the island. As the dire situation continued, the migration to the mainland mushroomed, and the deaths directly attributable to the aftermath of Maria continued to mount with a surge of suicides. Economic anxiety mounted. Many professionals were noted to leave the island. There was a crisis in the loss of medical staff, a particular concern that I heard on the national news was the, the departure of many OBGYN specialists and a lack of adequate prenatal care for pregnant women and reproductive services for women. So we were, we were lucky at Pro Familias not to lose staff. Absolutely. And mm -hmm. one of the um, other agencies that the Hispanic Federation funded was Madres Ayudando a Madres, Mothers mm -hmm. Helping Mothers, or Mujeres, Women mm -hmm. Helping Mothers, which is a core of... Um, midwives that on bicycles would go into the country and provide mm. prenatal care and provided mm. the service for free. Right. Um, so the, the, the women going through and the girls going through all this trauma, you're a psychologist. Um, what do you as a professional offer them? What kind of help do they need professionally? They need to be able to find uh, agencies and resources that they are familiar with. I, it, like people started coming, they knew if Pro Familias opened, they would receive the help there. Right. So getting that kind of help was critical. Um, so it's important to appreciate the, that the impact went on for months. How many of you can imagine living under these conditions for months? Leaving your iPhone at home can cause <laughs> significant stress for the day. <laughs> Never mind having to figure out how to live in this new reality without electricity and with no predictable end. Pro Familias strove to reopen quickly to address the needs of the women who are familiar with their services and were able to reach their offices. With the increasing austerity measures being imposed by the Oversight Board in Puerto Rico, the specter of the dramatic reduction in funding of medical care and the reduction of quality of education through the closing of hundreds of schools, it is, it is raising the likelihood that Puerto Rico will resemble post-Katrina phenomena, further traumatizing the vulnerable low-income residents who make up a large portion of the island. I forget what the high percentages of people, low-income families. 57% of the people in Puerto Rico live in, below the poverty line. In Puerto Rico, um, the poor did not return to New Orleans. With their homes destroyed, they remained where they went for refuge and did not have the means to rebuild. In Puerto Rico, many will not return, and more will leave due to the basic needs of basic health care and quality education for their children. Ma many also lack the means to rebuild. On the island, everyone has a Maria story. There is palpable anxiety with the advent of each hurricane season. Uncertainty prevails for many families due to the slow recovery. Right. Now, the, um, the families forced to flee their homes or come to New York, um, 
you, you treat families in, as a professional. Right. Uh, uh, I, you, I volunteered at the Red Cross because okay. there was such a dearth and they kept asking for Spanish speaking um, right. mental health providers and I'd never joined the Red Cross but I finally responded to the appeal. It, it takes a little while to get qualified. But right. when working in the Red Cross, between, the, between September and January, each day brought a wide variety of individuals and families with varying degrees of shock and distress. The center was well set up to provide a wide range of resources and services. As you might imagine, most difficult was housing. Most were being put up by low-income families in mm -hmm. overcredit conditions and restrictions such as Section 8. Consequently, a portion were housed in shelters. Those who had prescriptions from national chains such as well, uh, Walgreens or CVS fared better as their information could be accessed from the national database. Others were required to receive medical evaluations and were referred to HHC facilities in order to renew prescriptions even if they knew exactly what they were being prescribed. Many individuals had been without both medical and psychiatric medications and supplies since September and we were seeing people in November and December and January who had gone without their medications. Uncertainty prevailed in all areas of their lives. How long would they remain with their host family? Could they return? Should they return? When should they return? Also palpable was their sense of loss. Friends from school, family members, some came because they were ill and had to leave others behind. Each story was distressing and pain-filled. And very often when they started talking about the event, um, if you've ever seen someone who's gone through a significant trauma, they, they, would, they could be talking about something not, you know, difficult and suddenly their whole demeanor changed because they were back mm. in the event. Mm. Uncertainty has continued for many of these Maria refugees since the recovery has been so slow and the means to re, uh, rebuild escapes many of them. Uh, and with the impending austerity cuts, more may be fleeing. Yeah. Um, I want to move ahead to talk about Venezuela, but before I leave Puerto Rico, you and your family have done a lot to raise okay. awareness there. and. Um, so what, what is your suggestion for the uh, members well, of the audience? I, um, I think for Puerto Rico, I think we all clearly early realized that um, the government's response was very slow. So with the help of the Hispanic Federation, um, our family worked very hard to get many, many donations through that particular agency and then worked with local municipalities to distribute a lot of resources. Um, in particular, I wanted to announce with respect to, because of my visits to Pro Familia in particular, uh, the Miranda family and the Hispanic Federation Unidos is launching a five-year fund for reproductive health in Puerto Rico to fund sex education, health services for marginalized women. Uh, it's a three, it's gonna be a million dollars over five years, and there's gonna be three pillars. One is to um, provide funding for sex education, which is so important and needed on the island. The second will be for training of medical, young medical staff. Half of the uh, abortion providers in Puerto Rico are 70 and older. And it's very difficult to attract new medical staff. So between, uh, we're looking at loan forgiveness, as an underserved place, as well as uh, subsidizing rotations through um, and training in Puerto Rico through res uh, medical training, uh, residency programs. Um, and I forget what the third one was. Uh oh, hold on. And there's a third. Oh, and then because there's because poverty is so prevalent, although some people, a lot of people have some basic insurance, many women can't even afford to get reproductive services. So uh, a portion of that, the third pillar will be to provide funds for women with no means to be able to get uh, services, including terminations, which are, would be too costly for them. That's okay. Thank you, it's fantastic. Thank you.
Um, we're going to hear more about the effect of trauma on the patients and clients we serve. I want to turn to uh, Marta, uh, you know, the director of Pro Familia in Colombia, and I, I must say, um, the Pro Familia in Colombia is the most amazing clinic I've been in, in this, on the planet for the following reason. <laughs> when you go to the front desk, they have across the front, they have the photographs of five women who have changed history or that they think are emblematic in some way about uh, feminism or reproductive rights. And the five women are Marilyn Monroe, Betty Page, Madonna, Frida Kahlo, and Margaret Sanger. <laughs> so my, my grandmother made it to Bogota. So, uh, so Colombia, um, Colombia seems it, it, Colombia can't catch a break. It's had a civil war for 40 years, and now has Venezuelan migrants coming in, and you are caught in the middle. Uh, trying to provide health care. Tell me first about the, the, con the, the civil war, the, the, the conflict. Uh, there, there is a peace accord, mostly, but uh, talk about the effect of, of this war on, on women and girls and, and how, they, how they are coping. First, I have to say that you have a very good memory, and I, because it's not easy to remember those five women that we choose as representative of the, the advances that the world has had regarding sexual and reproductive rights. And thank you so much, uh, IPPF team and Alex and Giselle, for putting this together. And a special thanks to all of you for taking the time and coming all the way here to hear our stories and, and the challenges that each one of us faces when it comes to advancing our mission, which is the defense of the sexual and reproductive rights of all people. And yes, you are right. Um, it's more than 50 years. Colombia is an amazing country. I have a saying, a personal saying, that goes that everything that is good in Colombia is amazingly good you know, people, what we do, the way we live. But at the same time, when things are bad, people can be really, really bad. So we have been suffering for more than 50 years for an extreme, extreme violent context. And as you all share, you know, uh, different reasons, but at the end, the fact, the true fact is that women and girls suffer disproportionately the consequences, not only of humanitarian crisis or natural disasters, but of armed, internal armed conflicts like the ones that we have seen for more than 50 years. And sadly, most of those consequences are closely related to sexual gender-based violence. Who, I mean, rape, who get rape mostly? women who are forced to carry out a pregnancy women who are forced to have abortions we have seen cases of girls 19 18 years old who had had nine abortions forced abortions under the armed conflict in colombia who are forced from their homes who are still searching for their children for their families for their husbands and still do not know where they are because even though, you are right, Alex, even though we have a signed peace treaty for the past two years, the truth is that what does it take for a whole country to leave behind 50 years of internal armed conflict and finally reconcile with a foreign story? It takes truth. We need the truth to come forward, and that has not happened. Even though, and I have to recognize that the efforts our government, our past governance have, have made, trying to find and create spaces through which we can finally reconcile with, with everything that has happened, they have created the historical memorial center, the victim units, 
they have even appointed a very important, a well-known lawyer in Colombia as the High Commissioner for the Stabilization and um, Consolidation of the Peace Processes. And all of these are spaces through which a safe place have to be created in order for victims, survivors, and aggressors to come and put the truth and speak about it. That has not happened. For the past two years, on the contrary, what we are experiences, experiencing locally, and I have to say that maybe the image that we are sending is that we are you know, moving ahead with the peace process, but the truth is that for Afro-descendant women, for the indigenous population, for rural women, that peace has not arrived yet. We have not seen it. Why? Because we are still suffering from huge amount of communities that have been displaced. In this year, only in these three months of the year, 21,000 families have been displaced from their homes. Why? Because the drug trafficking business is still going on. Because there are a lot of those guerrilla soldiers that drop at their arms are going back to those rural spaces. And why is all this happening? Because we, are not, we do not want to face the truth of what has happened in our country. And again, when it comes to the truth, what we have seen in the spaces, and while I was listening to you, how important it is, is not only having accesses to services, is not only um, be made, being able to recognize your rights, but it has to do with all the stereotypes regarding women in Latin American country. Because the truth is, is that we still live in a very machista environment, patri very patriarchal. They are still the ones who are deciding on our lives. They are still the ones that are deciding in our autonomy. And, so, and, that, and that will be our next program at the cathedral about how to deal with the men in Latin America. That <laughs> definitely has to be. <laughs> A purpose, so, a right. purpose. <laughs> so, I, I'm, Marta, I want to move on to the, the border between Venezuela and Colombia, um, several hundred miles long, varied terrain, um, and you are operating clinics there. Tell me what you are, what you are seeing and how, how, are you, how are your clinics coping? How do you get supplies? How do you get staff? And what, what, are, the, what are you seeing with the patients and the, and the families? Yes, as you know, and getting it together with what I was experiencing, what I was sharing with you is, you know, we started seeing this huge, um, massive movement of migrants coming into a hostile, already hostile country. Uh, we shared 2,200 kilometers, Venezuela and Colombia, and you can cross between both countries throughout all those 2,200 kilometers. There are three official entry points, but the rest of the passes are through mountains, rivers, uh, deserts. And uh, we have 35 clinics in the country, and we provide in a year around 1,600 mobile brigades. And it is through these two models through which we are reaching women. I think it's very important to mention something that when the crisis started, when the migrant crisis started, uh, we were invited to most of the technical te tables that were created around uh, the country uh, from the government and the local governments. And I can tell you that none of those spaces, sexual and reproductive rights were there. We were invited we, because we were provided of services, but not because we were specialists in sexual and reproductive services. And this is very important because the whole country rushed to provide clothes, uh, um, blankets, food. But when it comes to contraceptives, mm, you know, uh, we're not sure if we want to really help about that. When it comes to delivering something as simple as sanitary napkins, Mm, no, you know, that's not, it's not very, uh, it's not nice. We don't want to really donate that. So one of the, when, that, that was one of the first points that I want to make because it is very hard to get in those spaces sexual and reproductive services. It's not easy, it's not um, fashionable, to put it in some way. Why do the women started coming to our clinics and they came in such big amounts that some of our clinics collapsed? You know, we were... 
uh, the clothes had to be closed. The police will arrive to some of the clinics asking us, what are you doing here? What are you giving for free? Because why are there so many women? And I think that the main reason is that in Pro Familia, they found in all of our staff uh, people who really hear them without judgment. Almost all of the women that have managed to arrive to our clinics or the ones that we have served through our mobile brigades have suffered some type of sexual gender-based violence event. And I can share with you two, two, of the last, two of the last stories that we have had. Uh, Marcela, 19 years old, um, she was approached by three men crossing the border. These three men told her, we can help you pass on, on the text by the police forces. Um, they hold her almost for a week, abuse her for a whole week. When she finally managed to escape, she found a work uh, in a house and she found out she was pregnant. Her employer knew about Pro Familia. She helped her get to one of her clinics where she had an abortion. She did not want to denounce what had happened to her because fear of being deported back to Venezuela. The other one is a case that you were able to share with us when, when, when Giselle visited uh, our clinic in Rio Hacha. Uh, Silvia, 16 years old, she was captured by, by one of the many sex trafficking groups that have evolved all around the border. She was held captive for 15 days. She was forced to perform sexual labor for many, many men. She again uh, managed to escape. She arrived to one of her clinics and she found out that she was pregnant. She was there for a visit. She just wanted a contraceptive. During the visit, right there, she found out she was pregnant. We were able to do to provide her with a safe abortion service right there. So this is, these are many of the stories. Um, the truth is that they keep coming to our clinics. And I think that the biggest difference, as I told you at the beginning, is that we truly hear, we don't do judgment, judge them. Um, and we try to accompany through the whole process because it's not only that they have, they have to suffer being displaced for their homes without nothing left. Many times leaving their children, they already, these are women that most of them already have children in Venezuela, leaving their children behind, being abused, trying to cross the border and reaching a country where we already have a lot of things going on. So these are, these are, these are, these are the lives of girls and women um, also we have seen some cases of men, small boys, that has also suffered from sexual violence. And this is the reality that right. we are facing right now. And in the middle of all this, and the need for incre increased clinics and staffing, you lost over a million dollars in USAID funding because of the global gag rule, which is a US government policy which denies US foreign aid for family planning services to organizations that perform legal abortions in their country or that advocate for legal abortions. So you've, you, the US government is, has not been your friend um, in this. Uh, yes. How have you made that up? Quite a, quite a challenge because it's not only that they stop the funding that um, we usually used to get um, through the USAID around $1.2 million through which we would carry out comprehensive sexual and reproductive uh, rights and health delivery. And this is very important because it's not only that the funding stop because we advocate and provide abortion services, but it expanded, we saw an expansion and also affecting everything that has to do with HIV programs and mm -hmm. Zika which was an epidemic that started affecting many of the countries in Latin America. And at the end, the message that something like the gut rule is sending, uh, you know, the countries that have been affected is that it doesn't really matter the laws that you have locally. It doesn't really matter the public conditions that affect 
our countries. You know, abortion, unsafe abortion is a, is a, is a matter of public health in all of our countries because many women die because of unsafe abortion or the consequences of, being, or, of, of going to a clandestine clinic, which is not even attended by a professional. The, those affections car, uh, accompany the, the, the life of a woman forever. It's not only that. It is a message that laws do not matter that women's life do not really matter because they are in this crusade of you know righteousness and 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 I imposing their own right. their own way of thinking what we have been able to do is uh, or again thanks to IPPF uh, we have uh, gathered some resources and through them we are attending subsidizing the services that we provide to the migrant population that is coming into Colombia, but also, um, well, the actual, the, the, the concrete impact was that we have to close four of our clinics in four of the poorest communities in Colombia, mainly in, this, in the Pacific Coast, which is um, Afro-descendants and indigenous communities. We had to fire 110 people from our staff. Mm. Um, and the way we have been trying to keep on providing services to these places is through through the mobile brigades. But again, it's a huge difference when you are able to carry out a comprehensive program through which you can empower a whole community to just delivering a brigade through which you just provide services, very concrete assistentialist services. Okay. So even though we try to do our best, you know, at least it's something, at the end we know that it is a huge difference for those communities, uh, especially regarding uh, the possibility of having a different future and developing, you know, believing right. that they have a different future. Right. I want to turn now to the other side of the border um, in Venezuela. Uh, in Belmar, we're going to have uh, semi-simultaneous translation, uh, unless anyone wants to try out their high school Spanish and, uh, with, uh, with Belmar. Um, you're the director of the uh, our member association in Venezuela. You operate four clinics there. You're about to open a fifth, you tell me. Um, four million people have left Venezuela in this current crisis. Can you give, give us a quick overview about what's happening in, in the country? What's a typical day like? Is there power? Is there transportation? Is, is there safety on the streets? Uh, so if you can give us a a view of that. Thank you. Muchas gracias, Alex, por la invitación y a Giselle por la invitación y la traducción. Thank you, Alex, for the invitation and to me for the translation. We multitask. IPPF. Les voy a contar un poco la situación de Venezuela y cuál es nuestro día a día sobre todo la de las mujeres y de las niñas y adolescentes en mi país. So she's going to share about the situation in Venezuela and how the day to day looks like not just for healthcare providers but for women and girls in the country. Yo soy una persona privilegiada porque estoy en la región capital. She feels very privileged because she lives in the capital. Y está protegida de alguna manera en en cuanto al tema de servicios públicos son menos frecuentes los apagones, eh, hay un poco más de agua y un poquito más de transporte. So she, she feels very privileged because in the capital city the situation is slightly better. The, the shutdowns of water and electricity are less frequent than in the rest of the country and there is some sort of public transportation, limited but still existent. En el interior del país Puede haber eh, cortes de electricidad de hasta 12, 24 y 48 horas. So in the in the countryside the situation is very different. There can be blackout for 24, 48 hours, uh, very often. Hay eh, cortes de agua y no hay transportes ni medio de transporte para que las personas se puedan movilizar hacia sus trabajos, hacia las escuelas o hacia los lugares eh, comunes de, de, de su estado. And there is really no public, no water, no public transportation, so people can go to work or take the, their kids to school in any way. Un país productor de petróleo y no tenemos gasolina. Think that it thinks of the irony of a country that is the, one of the main producers of oil that right now doesn't have any gasoline. 
un país con un eh, avanzada eh, desde hace 20 años en el tema hidroeléctrico y no tenemos agua. And while the country has advanced for the past in the past 20 years about you know access to water, right now it doesn't have access the, the capacity to really uh, have water for people. El 50% de los médicos han salido del país. About 50% of healthcare provider doctors have left the country. El 80 well, let, me, let me ask about, have you lost healthcare providers at your clinics? Sí, hemos perdido eh, un gran número de profesionales de la salud relacionados con el área médica y de otros servicios. So yes, they have lost a lot of healthcare providers, but also uh, of other professions as well. Right. And so talk about the difficulties every day of getting uh, contraceptives in your clinics, uh, getting ultrasound machines to work if there's no electricity. Um, talk about the day-to-day -day operation of your clinics. Uh, todos los trabajadores que estamos en las clínicas vivimos las mismas situaciones de vulnerabilidad que, que, que vive cualquier persona de la población. What is really difficult is that all of our providers, all our self-working in the clinics, are not different, are, have the same exposure to the same challenges that anyone else living in the country. Y nuestra organización no escapa a las limitaciones que podemos tener en cuanto a acceso de servicios de electricidad, agua, transporte, pero además tenemos limitado el uso o, o la obtención de suministros médicos y de insumos médicos para poder trabajar. So, in addition to not having water, electricity, and all of it, which poses a lot of challenges for running a healthcare services, the institution also has a lot of challenges in accessing basic commodities to run the centers. Cuando un equipo médico se daña, no tenemos técnicos, no hay profesionales que puedan repararlo y hay que buscar afuera, en el exterior, eh, los repuestos o traer equipos de afuera para poder nosotros subsanar ese, ese, ese problema. Don't, don't even want to tell you what when medic, a piece of medical equipment gets damaged and you simply have to spend months trying to find a way to repair because the technicians are not there or trying to uh, ship some of the pieces from out of the country or take the equipment out of the country to have it repair. Hemos tenido que tener eh, puntos estratégicos con el gobierno que nos permitan de alguna manera poder traer anticonceptivos por medio de donaciones a través de fundaciones, a través de la IPPF y de donantes del exterior. And they have been able to bring contraception. They have been able to keep some sort of dialogue with the government for them to allow contraceptives to enter the country, both through donations, through our IPPF works, and that's the way they have uh, been able to function. Estamos seguros de que ellos no nos han atacado porque somos la única alternativa que tienen para minimizar un poco el tema de acceso a métodos anticonceptivos para las mujeres y adolescentes. The, she's pretty sure that the reason the government still didn't close them down or attack them has to do with the fact that they know that they are the only place for women to access contraception in the country today in a consistent way. Pero tenemos que ser cuidadosos eh, con el gobierno y, y con la parte política para no tener consecuencias negativas de expropiación de las sedes o de poner eh, presos a las personas que trabajan en la institución. But, but we have to be very careful and constantly live on the edge. We have to be very careful about how we engage and what we say, what we don't say, so the government doesn't close down our clinics and just expropriate mm -hmm. them. In, in the last uh, few years, you've had the combination of the government um, malfeasance and disorganization combined with the Zika crisis, which Venezuela faced. Um, and I, I'm interested in how, how women and girls have reacted to these twin crises in, and what are they doing about their sexual and reproductive lives and how, how are they changing um, their behavior and their contraception and their childbearing. <coughs> El problema del Zika ha sido invisible para el país. Zika has been an invisible problem for the country. Para el año 2015 se había proyectado 70.000 casos de Zika. In 2015 they had projected about 70,000 cases of Zika. 
pero para el 2016 eh, la Asociación Venezolana de Salud Pública había proyectado 700.000 casos de Zika. But for 2016, the Public Health Association of Venezuela had projected about 700,000 cases of para el Zika. Para el gobierno no hay Zika en Venezuela ni nunca la epidemia hizo estación en Venezuela. So for the government, Zika doesn't exist in Venezuela. They completely ignore the fact that This is there. Esto ha traído consecuencias inimaginables para las mujeres afectadas, especialmente las mujeres embarazadas, por supuesto, y los niños afectados por microcefalias y todas las complicaciones y anomalías que esto ha traído como consecuencia. So the, the, she cannot begin to explain the consequences for women, uh, not only in that Zika is a sexually transmitted uh, mm -hmm. infection, but also the result of the likely result of having um, a microcephaly, a pregnancy with microcephaly, and the more than 200 conditions mm -hmm. associated to the uh, disease uh, uh, when when children are born with microcephaly and those. Plafan hizo una investigación sobre el tema de Zika y la afectación en la salud sexual y reproductiva, y encontramos que las mujeres fueron abandonadas desde el estado y no tuvieron respuestas ni oportunas ni eficaces contra este virus. So, Plafam conducted some research on the effect of on women and they clearly found that the state had abdicated on them, abandoned them um, when they uh, found out they were they had Zika. Los proveedores de salud tampoco tenían información. Health providers didn't have much information. Y las mujeres buscaron ayuda con las propias mujeres. And as always, women sought help uh, with other women. Pudieron asociarse y buscaron herramientas en internet, en otros, leyendo en otras publicaciones de Brasil, de Colombia, y pudieron ellas mismas apoyarse para tratar a sus hijos afectados con Zika. And trying to create support groups, seeking information from other countries like Colombia and Brazil, where most, more information was available. No hay proveedores de salud especializados que puedan atender a los, a los niños y niñas afectados por Zika, ni a las madres emocionalmente para trabajar el tema de cómo ellas poder sobrellevar esta situación. And we don't have in the country providers that are prepared to both um, help uh, children with disabilities as a result of Zika or women who have gone through this experience. Right. So with this picture, Let me ask you a final question. You get up in the morning, what gives you hope to carry on? Cuando me levanto en las mañanas y me dirijo a mi trabajo, veo cientos de mujeres, jóvenes, niñas de 10, 15, mujeres de 30, 40 años que están buscando servicios de salud. So when she gets up in the morning and goes out, she sees lines of women, very young women, that are lining up for sexual and reproductive health services. Mujeres que salen desde muy temprano de sus hogares, muchas veces exponiendo su vida uh, como el tema de, de inseguridad. Otras vienen del interior del país y pueden pasar 24 horas durmiendo en la asociación hasta que nosotros abrimos en la mañana. When she opens the door of the clinic, she sees and greets women who have traveled very long distances to get there, um, uh, enduring uh, very difficult circumstances. And um, many of them have, that come from the countryside have, um, have uh, camped in front of our clinic for 24 hours for them to be able to be seen by, by a doctor. Y tenemos un grupo de profesionales sensibilizados que están allí esperándolas para ser atendidas y atenderlas con calidad, con sensibilidad y poder darles y brindarles una atención clínica eh, efectiva, oportuna, eficaz para protegerlas de un embarazo no deseado, de un embarazo forzado o de una infección de transmisión sexual. And so that gives me hope along with the team of very committed healthcare providers who also get up every morning to go and help women who need protection against um, sexual and reproductive health, sec uh, sexually transmitted diseases, forced pregnancy or anything else that they need. You know, I've been um, involved in Planned Parenthood for 
most of my life. Um, and I've been surrounded by extraordinary women. But what a group today we've had the honor of listening to. Um, I thank you all for sharing your stories and uh, your work with us. Um, the challenges that we and you face are ongoing. Um, I, I, I can predict there's going to be more climate disasters uh, and political disasters in, in this hemisphere um, and worldwide, but we at Planned Parenthood and our local organizations are the, are the first responders uh, for women and girls in, in crisis. Uh, and we, we know you, and you know, having heard these stories from the local providers, that local organizations are the best because they're on the ground, they know the communities, uh, their staff know the patients and the, and the women and girls that need us, um, and we know what communities need, and communities trust us um, to deliver um, th the services that they need. So I just would like to, um, to ask our audience to thank all of you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Muchas gracias. <laughs>